Hello and welcome to this Open Research Institute video. I'm Paul, KB5MU. Today's project is to get familiar with the IECA SR1 and set up a test scenario using DVB-S2 and the SR1 to receive. This would be a typical situation if we were testing a newly developed transmitter, maybe an FPGA implementation for satellite. Today, we're going to use GNU Radio as a source. This is tried and true and is a good test bench for a lot of testing. This is an IECA SR1. This device is designed to work with DVB-S2, not S2X, and generic stream encapsulation. That's an add-on piece of firmware that we've put on this particular unit. It has two RF inputs, which work at L-band, a gigahertz plus or minus, and it has these two Ethernet jacks on the back. One is for management, configuration menus and so on, and the other is for the data coming in and out, the traffic. There's also this USB port, which can be used for serial I.O. In the remote lab, the serial port of the SR1 is connected to the VM known as ChacoCat. So the first thing we're going to do is log on to ChacoCat and make a connection to that serial port. Here I am on my laptop computer. Uh, I'm sitting here in my simulated dining room and all I'm going to use is my laptop. This is going to be a fully remote operation. I'm not going to touch any of the equipment during this demonstration. Just me and my laptop. Here I am logged in. I've got my WireGuard network set up and I'm just going to SSH into ChacoCat, which is the VM that has the serial port. Okay, now I'm logged into ChacoCat and the easiest way to talk to a serial connection is with screen and then just the name of the serial port. UTY USB 2 in this case, and the baud rate, 115-200. And this gets me connected. I have to hit 0 to make it wake up the menu. And here is the sign-on screen for the SR1. It says SR1G because it has the GSE firmware in it. Serial number information and hardware version information and so on is across the top. There are two receivers shown, RX1 and RX2. We're just going to use RX1 for this experiment. And then a menu, 1 to 6. If we look in these menus, all you have to do is type a number. So 1 gets me into the configuration menu. There's a couple of different channels of configuration. Again, we're going to use just channel 1, which has this configuration uh, set for 1280 megahertz, which is just an arbitrary number, but it's in the ham band, and DVB-S2. And notice down here near the middle, there's generic stream encapsulation is turned on. And zero always gets you back out of these menus. So I hit zero a couple of times to get back to the main menu. And let's take a look at uh, the current status. And we're only interested in channel one, so I'm going to hit one to get into that. And here's the current status. It's not locked, so there's no signal currently. We're going to have to generate a signal to allow it to uh, receive anything. Hitting zero to get back out again. Let's look at the network setup. Uh, the management port is connected to uh, this IP address you see here at the top, 1073.1.11. That's just the network address in the remote lab's private LAN. Looking down a little further, the LAN IP address is for the traffic port. And it is set up with an IP address in the ham radio net 44 block, 44.0.1.100. Uh, .1 I just picked arbitrarily. And look a little further down. Whoops, it timed out. It'll do that. So I'm just going to go back in with three again. Uh, item number E here says router IP address. It's in expecting to receive packets over the air and then send them out to devices. So in this case, we're going to be receiving uh, test packets. We want to send them on to an Ethernet port that we can monitor. In this case, the router is going to be where those packets go. And I've assigned it the ad address 44.0.1.99. Okay, that's all we need from this screen. Let's just look on the system screen briefly. You can see there's resets and, and various kinds of information here. None of it, I think, is relevant to this experiment. And five gets me statistics. Again, I'm only interested in number one. Notice it's all zeros. There's nothing coming in right now. In order to get these numbers to change from zero, we have to send some data through. 
And before we can do that, we have to establish a DBBS2 signal. So going back to the main display, as long as these both say not locked, in particular RX1 says not locked, um, then we don't have a signal. That's pretty much all you need to know about the SR1 for this purpose. Um, now we need to generate a signal. And as I mentioned, we're going to try to use GNU radio to do that. This is a brand new VM. It's completely from scratch. I've got a new Ubuntu install provided by the lab manager. That's me, but never mind that. And we're going to install GNU radio from scratch and bring it all the way up to transmitting signals that can be received by the SR1. So let's start with a new window, make it a little bit bigger. We also need some instructions. So let's go to the web and take a look at the installing GNU radio web page. I just typed in install GNU radio into Google and this is the first thing that came up. This is from the GNU radio website. And the box across the top that says Linux is exactly the instructions we need. The first step is to install Ubuntu 20.04. Let's be released dash A. Sure enough, we're running Ubuntu 20.04.4 LTS, long-term support. This is a good stable release of Ubuntu to work with. Coming back over here to the web, the first thing we do, step two, is to install a new repository. So I'm just going to copy that and come over here to the window and paste it in. It needs me to hit enter to confirm that I want to do that. And it'll download some stuff and then it'll know about this new repository. There it is. Step three is to do an app get update. Might not really need to do that. So it looks like it already did that for itself, but I'm going to go ahead and um, and follow the instructions. Okay, that's all updated. And the last thing to do is install GNU Radio. Along with that, you also install Python 3-packaging. There we go. This installs a whole mess of different packages. Uh, GNU Radio is quite extensive. Many of these are not going to be needed for what we're doing here, but we'll go ahead and install the whole GNU Radio uh, ensemble and uh, have everything we need for the future. So hit yes. It'll download all that stuff. It'll install all that stuff. It'll take a couple of minutes. So we'll be back when it's done. Okay, Gunny Radio has been installed successfully. Very good. There's one other package we're going to need. GNU Radio has support for transmitting DVB-S2 built into the main package, but transmitting GSE, the generic stream encapsulation, is not yet in the main line for GNU Radio. So we need to install what's called an out-of-tree module in order to get that capability. So let's go back to the web browser and bring up this page. It's on GitHub, github.com, slash drmpeg slash gr dash dvbgse so it's a GNU radio package for dvb generic stream encapsulation and all the source code is here for you to study and modify and do whatever you want with i'm going to scroll down through this extensive readme it describes setting up the test scenario we're going to use it also describes setting up a, a more elaborate test scenario uh, which we're not going to do today and down at the bottom is the instructions on how to build it and install it. So we need to do that. Let's start here where it installs a dependency, libpcap dev. So back over here, we need to sudo apt install libpcap dev. Yes. Okay, that dependency is installed. The next step is to clone the repo and put that in a directory somewhere. It can be anywhere. Uh, I kind of like to put those sorts of things in documents and make a directory called git that has all my git repos in it and clone into there. So git clone https colon slash slash github.com slash drmpeg slash gr dash dvbgse. 
This fails because we haven't installed Git yet. That's not part of the standard install, or not the minimalistic install that we started with for Ubuntu. So we better install that. Okay, now we have Git. Let's try that in the clone again. Now it's working. Okay, now we have a copy of that out of tree module. And we can go back to the directions. Make dir build and cd build. Whoops, I did that wrong. First I should have cd'd into the directory. And then we make dir build. cd build. And the next thing is to run cmake. There is one thing that's not in the instructions that we need for our installation. We need to define cmake install prefix, all caps, and it's slash user. Uh, by default, it would be slash user slash local, and that doesn't match how GNU Radio gets installed uh, the way we installed it. So with this define on the command line, it'll match. And then dot dot slash tells it where to find its uh, CMake config file. So hit that. Uh-oh, we don't have CMake either. So apt install CMake. Okay, now we have CMake. Let's try that again. And it runs, and it's completed without error. Going back to the instructions, the next thing to do is make. This will take just a, a short while. It's not a very large module. We'll watch it. There we go. So now we have that module built. The last two steps are to make, install, and load config. So make, install, sudo, load config. That tells it to go find the libraries that we just built and installed. If I go up one directory and then go into the apps directory, there are two flow graphs in here. These GRC files stands for GNU Radio Companion. Um, one of these is going to be the basis for our test. I'm going to copy that dvb2 dvb s2 underscore txip.grc uh, to my desktop because I'm going to be making a few changes to it. I don't want to change the one here in my checkout. Okay, so good. We should be in a, in a position to run GNU Radio now, except for one thing. Let's go ahead and try it and see what happens. If I just run GNU Radio Companion, uh-oh, it errors out right away. And you see stuff about widgets and screens. And the problem here is that we're at a command line. All we have is a terminal. And we need uh, a graphic interface. We need VNC. The VNC server should have been installed with the fresh VM. Let's find out. VNC server dash list. Okay, it's there. In fact, there's one already open. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kill that one because that's from some previous testing. So kill colon two. All right. And then list again. Now there's none. And I'm going to start one of my own. VNC server localhost no colon six is the number for this computer. That runs a VNC server that we can use. And because I use six, which is the number assigned to me on this computer, uh, it wouldn't interfere with anybody else running VNC servers. Uh, now I just need to connect to that VNC server. And it's uh, nuts.sandiego.openresearch.institute colon 5906, because I used 6 on this computer. I'm not worried that it's not encrypted because we're already working over an encrypted LAN. And I enter the password that I set up. And here's my graphic user interface uh, to nuts. Uh, don't worry about the colors being wrong. They'll fix themselves here in a second. There we go. 
and I'm just going to open a terminal. And here's my terminal. Uh, don't worry that it's too small to see. All I'm going to do right now is run GNU Radio Companion. And it should come up. Uh, let's not worry about this previous crash. But here's a, a nice empty GNU Radio Companion that launched successfully. All I need to do is open that flow graph that I copied onto the desktop. So desktop, and there's the flow graph. Now here it is. This is an entire uh, DVB S2 transmitter uh, for data. If you look in the upper left hand corner, you'll see a box called IP packet source. That grabs packets off of the local network configuration. I'll talk about that in a second and creates baseband frames in a DVB S2 format. And then it passes through all these boxes, the BB scrambler, the BCH encoder, the LDPC encoder, the interleaver, the modulator, physical layer framer, and a final filter. And then goes out to two destinations. One is just a display, a spectrum analyzer sort of display, which we'll see on our screen here. And the other is an SDR in order to actually generate RF output. In this case, we have it configured to use a USRP. Uh, the USRP is not a permanent part of the remote lab, but we have it hooked up right now between the, uh, the VM, which will be running GNU Radio, and the SR1, which will re be receiving the RF coming out of the, uh, of the SDR. So, I wonder if we're ready to run it. Uh, let's push go and see what happens. The first thing you get is this warning. This is always happens when you run GNU Radio for the first time, unless you configure the X term. Uh, we don't care about that, so I'm just going to click OK. And look down here in the bottom left, that's where the, uh, the messages are. I'll make a little more room for them. Uh, got some errors. The first error seems to be about the USRP. It, it hasn't actually found the US, USRP yet because we skipped a step. We need to install uh, at least a little bit more software for the, uh, for the USRP to work. So let's go back to our terminal window. Actually, I don't like the, uh, the graphic terminal window so much. Let's go and grab one of these terminal windows. What we need to do is install uh, UHD, which is the name of the universal driver for uh, USRPs, uh, host. These are the host mode, host programs that, that apply to UHD. In other words, the programs that run on your computer. Okay, now we're running the, the install. Okay, now we have the programs for the USRP. So the first thing we need to do is run this UHD images downloader. Run that. This grabs the, the firmware files for the FPGA that go, is inside the USRP. And it writes them to user share, which we don't have permission to write unless we say sudo first. So let's do that. Now it'll download all these files. It's downloading the firmware for all possible USRPs instead of just the one we need for the USRP that's connected. But that's okay. It takes a minute. Okay, now we have all the images. Now let's run uh, UHD USRP probe. That actually finds the, uh, the device. I just use sudo here. I probably should have set up udev rules instead, but I think the sudo will get us past this point more quickly and we can move on. Notice it's loading both firmware and a FPGA image into the USRP. And it dumps a bunch of information about the USRP when it's done. Now, maybe we have what we need to run the flow graph. Let's find out. Okay, now it's initializing the USRP. It got the clock rate it wanted, that's all great. And then there's another error. 
let's see, something about BB header source, and it's an IO control error. Uh, remember I mentioned that that first block of the flow graph grabs packets off the networking part of the computer? Well, we haven't set that up yet. Let's go set that up, and that'll make this error go away. Let's look again at the GR DBB GSE instructions. And we want to go up near the top of the README file where he describes how to set up the experiment. The first instruction here is this set cap. Uh, this is a, a workaround for a permissions problem in Linux. Uh, normally, uh, ordinary user programs would not be able to capture packets out of the networking stack at all. You can run your program under sudo so it has root access and then it would be able to, but it would also be able to do all sorts of things that you'd rather not allow it to do. So instead, you can find a program, the program you're going to run, and, and give it special per permissions to do the networking thing. Um, because the program we're running is actually a Python program, we have to assign the privileges to Python. That's a security problem. You wouldn't want to do this on a public machine. but. We're in a VM behind a login on a private LAN, and I think it's probably safe enough. So we're going to copy this instruction, go back to our terminal, and paste it in, and get errors. Why are we getting errors? Uh, because the instruction says 3.x, and it needs to say 3. something specific. 3.8 seems to be uh, what we have here. So let's take that and then move on to the next instruction. This block of five instructions creates a fake network interface, almost like an Ethernet card in your computer, but entirely imaginary in software. This will be the destination to which we write packets that need to go out through our GNU Radio-based transmitter. Uh, we'll simply write them to this fake interface, and the packet uh, snooping that we talked about before will intercept them as they go to that interface and send them out over the air instead. Cool. So I'm going to copy all of these instructions as a block, go back to our terminal, and paste them in. And now we've set up tap0. If we do an ifconfig, uh, we don't have ifconfig, let's install that. Now if we do an ifconfig, we'll see that there are several network interfaces. The last one listed here is TAP0, the one we just created. It has the network address we specified, and in fact it has the Ethernet hardware address that we specified as well. And if we look up toward the top of that list, we also have two Ethernet adapters here. The first one, ENP1S0, is actually also fake. It's the one that lets the VM pretend it's on the local LAN. Um, so it's provided by the virtualization system. And we're not going to use that directly. The second one, the one starting with ENX and having a long hex number after that, that's an actual Ethernet adapter plugged into the USB port of the VM. And that is connected to the traffic port on the SR1. That's where we're going to want to listen for packets coming out of the SR1 that have gone over the air, been received, and come back out. And remember, the SR1 puts those out to the LAN router address. So we need to ensure that this uh, monitor port, the ENX uh, port, has the right IP address to accept those packets. So let's do that now. Uh, the way we do that is sudo ip address add, and we're going to give it an address in a different subnet of the net 44 LAN. I'm going to give it 99 slash 24 broadcast 44.0.1.255. That's a standard format for a broadcast address. And the device is going to be the ENX, and it'll autocomplete. I hit tab instead of typing that long hex number. Now if I do ifconfig again and scroll up to the ENX one, 
you'll see that it now has this address and the mask and the broadcast that we set up. This is good. And we should be able to receive stuff on that address. Just for fun, it'd be nice to know what's coming over that address right now. There's no signal going over the air, but there might still be packets. Maybe we should find out what's there. The coolest way to do that is with a program called Wireshark. Uh, I'm going to install that. And I'm also going to install T Shark, which is a, a text mode command line version of the same thing. This has a few packages. It'll take a little bit of a time to install. I do want to allow non uh, root users to capture packets. Okay, Wireshark and T Shark have been installed. So I'm going to go ahead and try running T Shark with the interface, the ENX. No, it's not going to autocomplete that. Let me grab a copy of that name. Here it is. Copy. And then paste. And it won't do it. Uh, this is expected. The problem is that, that when I answered yes, that I want everybody to be able to capture packets, everybody doesn't really mean everybody. To, in order to be able to have permission to capture packets, I need to be a member of the group called Wireshark. So I have to add myself to that group. sudo usermod-a-capital-g, the group name Wireshark, and my username, kb5mu. Okay. And to confirm that, let me type groups, which just lists the groups that I'm currently in. And you'll see that Wireshark is not in there. Unfortunately, the groups setting doesn't take effect until you log out and log back in. So I'm going to do that now. All right, here I am back in a fresh session. Let's see if, okay, now I'm a member of the Wireshark group. So let's try that T-Shark command again. Now it's capturing on that interface. And if we wait a few seconds, we'll see if there's any traffic. There might not be any. Ah, uh, here's some. Uh, this is a message from the IECA device, the, from the SR1, to a broadcast address. It's an ARP query. It's looking to find out who has that address 440199, which is the router address. And it wants the answer sent back to itself at 440100. And you notice there's no responses coming right now. So we need to fix that. Uh, for some reason, that port is not currently responding to ARP. Uh, let's look again at ifconfig. See if we'll have a clue there. So there's, there's nothing here about it not responding to ARP. There would be a no ARP. Uh, in this line here if, if if ARP had been turned off. So that's not, not what's going on. We need to find some other explanation for why it's not responding to this ARP. Let's take a look at the routing table. Interesting. So we have a route for 10.73.1, which is the, the local, the LAN at the remote lab which goes to the virtual, virtual machine's ethernet port. And we have a route for 44, which goes to the tap port, but we don't have any route that goes to the physical ethernet uh, device at 4401. Uh, why not? If we scroll up and look at the IF config results again, notice that this interface here does not have an IP address. We gave it one, but now it doesn't have one anymore. So I'm going to give it to it again.
Okay, let's look again. Now it has the internet address that we specified. And one of the other commands we gave must have cleared that out somehow. So let's try T Shark again and see what we see now. Okay, this is better. Now we see the ARP request, same as before, but now we're seeing an answer. And other stuff starts to happen. There's some background traffic going on in this network, the usual overhead stuff of computers trying to talk to each other, but no actual traffic. So if we get, can get some traffic added in here, that'll be a big victory. Okay, good. We've got the network set up now. Let's go back to GNU Radio. You'll see our, uh, our VNC window has timed us out. So I'm going to hit enter and enter my password again and be back in VNC. And now we'll try running it again. Maybe we'll get away without any error messages. Okay, let's see. It's finding... Oh, look at that. This graph that we see here is a spectrum plot of what we think we're transmitting. We can control how loud it is with, these, with the top gain in particular. I don't think these other two gains do anything on the USRP. And we've got a nice square topped DVB-S2 waveform. And it has whatever parameters that FlowGraph was uh, programmed to provide. So, what do you say we go look at the SR1 and see if it has acquired. I'm going to put it right out here on the edge so I can find it again and then get back out to GNU Radio. So, I'm going to hit zero to make it refresh and look where it says RX1. Now it has, it's locked. It's detected, our signal is DVB-S2 with a modulation of 8 PSK, coding rate of 5 sixth, about 6 megahertz, 6 mega symbols per second, uh, constant coding and modulation, and with a signal strength of 50.4 dB, which is a whopping signal. Good. We're receiving DVB-S2. So we've completed the first goal. We've created a DVB-S2 signal with Guinea Radio, and we've received it successfully with the SR1 receiver. Uh, all we have to do now is actually push some data through. If we go to the statistics display of the SR1 for channel one, you'll see there are a few BB frames have been detected, uh, but no bit rate being seen. Let's go to this other window, and I'm gonna generate some data. Um, First, I'm going to generate just one packet, and it's going to be a ping packet. Uh, ping is a way that network engineers use to test to see if I can get from here to there. I send a, a packet with some data in it, and it should echo right back. Now, in this case, uh, there's some trickery involved to make that happen. If we send a ping packet to a particular address, 44001, or 44002, I guess, um, Normally it would go out over the air and something on the far side of the world might respond to it, but we don't have any far side of the world. Instead we have uh, some fakery, fakery in the GNU radio flow graph. When a received ping request comes in over the air, it catches that as well and generates a fake response and puts it out on the network. So we, can, we will see responses if the network is configured properly uh, for this test, but they're not really coming from a remote host. Okay, so I'm going to make a, a ping with just one packet and send it to some host out there in net 44 land. And what happens? Nothing. or did it. Notice now we have showing 8 BB frames. Let me do it again. Look at the error. We got a response. This is a known bug. It eats the first packet or two. But now that we've got a packet that's come out and it's been echoed back, a successful ping. 
And if we set that up to run infinitely, just turn off the count restriction. So it's pinging once a second. And then look over here at the statistics. We'll see a data rate of about 704 bits per second uh, from these small packets going by once per second. Not bad. You can see it counting up and not missing any frames and doing, uh, doing quite well. So now we have reached the second level of success. We've actually transmitted some data over DVBS2, GSC, properly encapsulated, received it with the SR1, gotten the data out of the SR1 into the computer and processed it and generated a fake response. So this is not a two-way demonstration, it's a one-way demonstration, transmit to receive. The fakery is all in the response part. Let's see what we can do with this. Uh, ping is usually used for short messages and just a few of them, but you can also use it to generate lots of data. I am going to do that right now. I'm going to say ping at interval of one millisecond uh, with a packet size of, let's start with just 100 bytes. And let's, uh, let's send maybe 100 of them. to the same address as before. And when I do that, it's gonna flood the channel with, with a bunch of data, and we'll be able to see it in our statistics. So bang, uh-oh, there's a restriction here too. Uh, ping has, because it can generate lots of data, is restricted. In order to use it with such a short interval, I have to be root. So I just have to add sudo to the front of that. So bang, now we're generating lots of data. And what did that do? Look, all of a sudden my bit rate has jumped way up and it's, it didn't really last long enough to count. So I'm going to turn off this, this limitation on how many times it does it. So now it's generating pings much more rapidly and with somewhat more data in them. And we're getting 163,000 bits per second. Okay. Let's put in 100, 1,000 bits, 1,000 bytes in every packet. That's 10 times as much data. And what happens? We get 115,000 bits per second through the channel. Not bad. Okay, let's go up another factor of 10. 10,000 bytes per ping. So one thing that we see right away is that we don't get responses. Uh, there's some kind of a problem in the fragmentation. Once the packets get bigger than about 1,000 bytes, they have to be broken up into lots of little packets. And that's not apparently not quite being done right. So ping is not believing the responses, but it's still generating all that data. It's still going over the air. And look, look at this right here. Now we have 8 million bits per second going over this link. No bad fragmentation CRCs. It's just solid at eight megabits per second. And we could go back into the flow graph and change some of the parameters to get even more. So we're using about six megahertz of bandwidth transmitting eight megabits per second successfully with just a solid data link over DVB-S2 from GNU Radio, confirmed by the commercial hardware, the IECA SR1. And that is what we intended to achieve today. I think we learned a little bit about all the ins and outs, and hopefully we're more familiar with the SR1 as a piece of test equipment. So when it's time to test against our own implementation, uh, of FPGA or whatever we got, we'll have a solid test bench to test against and a reference to compare against. So thank you for your attention and come see us at openresearch.institute on the web.